The yellow islands were all the islands of the mind burning brightly in the safety of my own private darkness. They were places of essential and dangerous beauty, dangerous because they were somehow forbidden, anomalous, maybe truly monstrous. The linoleum games offered also a taste of infinity because they disrupted categories and suggested new ones. In the shadows of my room, I lived in the land of conjecture. When one is six, many questions cannot be asked because they cannot be formulated, let alone intimated. Two years pass. It is summer and there are eight of us. We play pirates, clue, cops and robbers, old maid, games of goose, poker, cowboys and Indians, and the games of our own invention. We play at hide and seek and I pride myself in the fact that I am hard to find. The year is 1951 and Senator McCarthy's brand of obscurification is packing steam. Our fathers are college professors and we are aware that the lethalities of the moment might possibly reach us as might the fallout from Russian nuclear devices. There is the threat of Martians and to a lesser degree of vampires. The brother of a classmate has been crippled by polio and another child has drowned. Shadows then of one kind and another. Our knowledge of the world is both intimate, the campus where our fathers teach, the woods, the Hudson River, and vastly incomplete. But as I'm a, I am about to discover the essential things that are kept from children, we'll manage to surge into the day. And it may even be that darkness is a place of safe keeping. So, the game is hide and seek and the afternoon is on the wane. We scatter and I run into a vacant lecture hall which is surely cheating and up three flights of stairs. At the end of a dim corridor is an unlocked door and suddenly I find myself standing in a beautiful room, spacious, its ceiling impossibly high, so high it seems the room has its own atmosphere. In fact, the air in that room smells strange, not familiar at all, not quite terrestrial. Recently, I came upon an obscure reference to a room where the angels, and I don't believe in angels, were said to receive their instructions. In my memory, this room seems a likely place because I'm about to find what I have unaware been seeking. It is the one thing each child, the child who has only recently left her tail, her gills behind, seeks. The human child who is always as eager to encounter a turtle as she is a tiger or a triceratops because she knows and her knowledge is innate and intimate that they are all of her tribe. Imagine a vast rectangular room, its west wall taken up with vertiginous windows. In the east, the sun hangs high above the roof and the room is heavy with shadows. The entire east wall is taken up with cabinets fronted with glass. Glass spills to the floor like a heavy water. The cabinets are old and pocked with bubbles. The glass is of uneven thickness so that like the restless objects of desire that elude Alice's eyes in the sheep's shop in Wonderland, things in the cabinet are both appealing and enigmatic. The sun slides down a notch and then another, and like an animated ink, the shadows within the cabinet begin to leak. They recede. The sun slides down another notch. Light floods the room, and in that white air, the objects within the cabinet catch fire. They twinkle. Now imagine that you see sidereal space clearly chartered. It is as if peering down a black hole, you see your own face reflected in a pool. The most essential knowledge until then glimpsed within the candle dig and the jelly jar, perceived but never before truly considered, hangs suspended in an ordered sequence, star after luminous star. Look, here is the modular chicken the entire progress of its gestation bare to the eye, and here, a fetal cat in levitation. To the left, a single natal lizard, and above, one preliminary lamb. All this announces the greatest treasure of all, the dizzying itinerary of the human fetus. It rides across an entire shelf. Each and every one of its gestures is expressive and luminous. And we are privileged, we are looking at the alphabet of sparks that spell the world. Some as mute as water, some hiss like fire, some are spear. These are the breath that reconciles water and fire. Here are all the points of departure. 
an alphabet of eyes, of the organs of speech, the five places of the human mouth, the one name, the one flame that cannot stand still, clairvoyance, the small intestines like seaweed floating towards the beach, the child's face cut from fresh clay with a knife of green leaves, the lotus flower upon which Buddha sits, a serpent at the world's edge, the embodiment of time's passage, the twelve constellations, the twelve organs of the body, all that has been baffling, hermetic, unfolds exquisitely palpable, and we know without a doubt that the ark is contained within each one of us. Three, tomb. In an ancient rock tomb of Egypt's Middle Kingdom, there is a painting of a marsh. Its thickets of papyrus riot with birds, everywhere nests brim with eggs. A fertile world in which butterflies and geese, duck, falcon, ibis all fly together. Knowingly painted, the butterflies are African monarchs, and because they are bitter, even toxic, they can fly in safety amidst all those beaks. Here the space between the fertile marsh and the upper sky suggests a divine intersection, a fluid boundary between a wealth of life we can barely imagine and the sacred impulse of generation. The sun itself is an egg. Within the Book of the Dead one reads, If the egg flourishes, then shall I flourish. If it lives, I shall live. If it breathes the air, I shall breathe the air. If it does not flourish, nor live, nor breathe the air, then I shall do none of these and die. Within this tomb that can be read like a book, the wings of the butterflies propose a secondary text with, within, with which the birds are conversant. The text clearly visible on the monarch's wings inform the birds of the butterfly's toxicity. Further, this reading is not contained within the painting. It unspools into the tomb. The pharaoh's gilded beard, so evident on the sarcophagus, his bound corpse within, are both made to evoke the monarch's chrysalis. The pharaoh's linens are studded with amulets in the form of butterflies. Back to the painting. A special attention has been given to the monarch's organs of courtship. The male's pencil hairs and the gland tucked within his hind wing, where his pheromones are kept, is clearly visible. When a male monarch encounters a female, he will use his pencil hairs to reach for a fragrant powder of crystals and dust the female's antenna. Enthralled, she will close her wings and receive him. He will enter her body in a dust storm of fragrance. The monarch butterfly's egg looks like an elongated pearl stitched with threads of moonlight. The writing on the monarch's wings, the nests and eggs balancing among the reeds, the creatures soaring in the interstices of marsh and upper sky, the pharaoh's bearded shroud all speak of the breath of life. What's more, sewn among the linens close to the pharaoh's body is the ankh, that symbol of life, of living, of the life that cannot die. All the gods carry the Ankh in their right hands. It is the oldest of all the amuletic signs, and it should come as no surprise that the Ankh is nothing more than a slight variation of the butterfly glyph. And if you all know what the Ankh looks like, it's crossed, yeah, without a top, it's a sun instead, so the T with the sun. So the, the butterfly.